Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe to the channel for regular content on ancient architecture as well as all the latest news from the world of archaeology. New robotic missions to explore the Great Pyramid get a lot of media attention. From Rudolf Gantenbrink's Upper War II robot in the 1990s to Pyramid Rover in the early 2000s and the Jedi robot a decade later. For those interested in pyramid exploration, technology really is our friend, especially in recent years with the Scan Pyramid's Muon test results, which discovered not one but two voids in the Great Pyramid. The first was the 9 meter long north face corridor behind the Pyramid Chevrons, and we've since got to see inside, and the other is what looks to be a grand gallery sized big void, and we hope to see into it in 2026. Modern technology is showing us parts of the Great Pyramid we've never seen before, and just like the use of LIDAR in the South American jungle, archaeology only benefits from scientific advances. But there is one pyramid mission that hardly ever gets a mention, and I imagine the majority of people watching this video have never heard of it, yet it took place as recently as December 2010. Known as Yersh-1, this research probe entered the upper part of the well shaft, which before being covered by a metal grate, could once be accessed from the bottom of the Grand Gallery. The probe was remote controlled, and fitted with a camera that was programmed to automatically take a series of pictures at set intervals, and thankfully with a flash. It was driven and controlled by a long cable, and, as you can see, it's not much to look at, having some kind of weird antenna-like appearance. These appendages, which were called elastic whiskers, stabilised the probe head in the centre of the shaft. And, from what I understand, the operator is in the Grand Gallery, and they pull a cable that compresses a spring, and then, on releasing the cable, the spring jerks back and propels the device forwards. This is repeated over and over, whilst photographing everything on the journey down. The camera was located on the head of the device, but instead of facing forward, it was positioned at a 90 degree angle, and that's so we could photograph one of the four sidewalls of the shaft on its descent. But this angled fitting of the camera was also for another reason, so that hopefully the independent researchers could peer into the grotto from inside the shaft. Amazingly, the method worked, and the mission of photographing the upper well shaft and getting a fresh look into the grotto was a relative success. So why isn't this mission more talked about? Well, as far as I'm aware, it wasn't an authorised official pyramid exploration mission the authorities were not involved. I guess you could call it a secret mission, undertaken by a group of independent Russian researchers who go by the name of the Alternative History Laboratory. Although things have now changed, apparently, and I don't know how true it is, the nature of the equipment meant it didn't require approval from local authorities. Yersh-1 could be carried into the pyramid in discrete pieces, it was quickly assembled and easy to use, and in a pinch it could simply be abandoned whilst retrieving the camera. The inside of the Great Pyramid is now fully covered with working CCTV, and the entrance to the well shaft is well and truly covered over, so there is no chance for any unauthorised work being done again all work must go through the Ministry of Antiquities. But I do commend the efforts of the researchers, because they were trying to fill an enormous gap in data, and now in the 21st century this really shouldn't exist. Before 2010, we only had a small handful of diagrams of the upper well shaft, and just a few old photographs of the grotto, which, to be honest, is ridiculous considering the enormous amount of universal interest in the Great Pyramid. Why every single part of the Great Pyramid can't be scanned and photographed, 
And then the images and 3D models made available to the public, I don't know. There have been great advances in photogrammetry technology, and I don't think it will be too expensive to do. It really would be a straightforward but important mission. But anyway, the Russian team that built Yersh-1 not only did this small non-destructive mission by themselves, they also released the photographs to the world. Which, in my opinion, is exactly what everyone involved in pyramid research should do. Make their data available to everyone. The amount of unpublished data from the Giza Plateau in the last century is really just astonishing. Apparently, the upper well shaft is just 60 to 80 centimeters in width, so a human can't really go down and take good pictures in such confines. So the pictures we got back from Yersh 1 were not only important, they were also incredibly rare. I don't think any other photos of the upper well shaft exist. Shortly, I'll be showing you every photograph that was taken by the device, and the link to the original pictures can also be found in the description below. As a disclaimer, for the most part they are not very exciting, just close-up views of masonry and the associated mortar that binds it together. The stonework is also very crude, and, to be honest, half the time it's hard to make out what we're looking at. And, due to a timestamp in the upper left-hand corner, you may think I'm posting the pictures upside down, but the logo of the research team in the top right-hand corner implies they should be this way up. And the reason I'm showing them in this video is to ensure as much pictures and data is out there, and accessible to everyone on YouTube. So if someone is doing research into the well shaft and grotto, well, they have something more to work with, and maybe someone will be able to get something important out of it. According to the researchers who ran this project, quote, from the first few meters of Yershwan's journey, the rather crude masonry of the shaft's walls becomes apparent. Most of the blocks are complexly shaped, and the gaps between them are filled with cement. Only occasionally are caverns visible, the presence of which is likely the result of the few explorers chiselling the shaft's walls, thus cutting footholds and handholds. They continue. On the rare ledges, mounds of dust and sand accumulated over the centuries are visible, and here and there, recently discarded entrance tickets to the pyramid are caught. The structure of the shaft walls turned out to be rather uniform, and nothing particularly noteworthy was discovered until reaching the rocky base of the pyramid. Perhaps at a depth of around 15 metres from the start of the descent, the masonry blocks of the shaft walls became more neat and rectangular. End quote. The camera did get a look into the grotto, and I'll discuss this further after we viewed the pictures. The device also continued for a few metres below the level of the grotto, but due to obstacles the mission ended, and the next series of photos were taken as the device was moving back up the shaft. So now, without further ado, here are the pictures.
so I did warn you they were not that exciting. But it's something. It's raw photographs, and it's more data for anyone researching the well shaft and the grotto. And you may have noticed these letters printed on the pictures of the grotto. They relate to this plan diagram and this old picture, to tell us what we're looking at. This is the well shaft running through the grotto, and this is the view of the camera on Yersh 1. The next photograph is taken about one meter lower, and only the lower edge of the grotto was in the field of view. The researchers noted how sometimes pebbles and sand are visible, and we know that the grotto was once full of this gravelly type material, which is most likely a natural accumulation in an old bedrock cavity which is what the grotto likely is. Due to the position of the well shaft entrance, at the bottom of the Grand Gallery, the Russian researchers believed the well shaft and the grotto could have served as drainage for rainwater that permeated through the pyramid, with the pebbles and sand having a specific drainage function, and this is something I'll discuss more in a forthcoming video. And I'll just point out this picture. The researchers said that this is a breach in the wall of the well shaft, at the boundary between the relatively irregular blocks and the rough masonry of the main body of the pyramid. They said, quote, The researchers who created this breach likely hoped to discover something interesting, but instead found only a mixture of the same pebbles and sand, a continuation of the mixture that made up the grotto ceiling. End quote. For me, it is interesting that the upper part of the well shaft looks to be made up of shapeless blocks and sloppy mortar, which, as I've said before, looks to be the case with the core of the Great Pyramid, disposing of the myth that it's made up of 2.3 million blocks of perfectly cut and placed limestone. Really, this just isn't the case. I have to thank the Russian team for sharing their pictures on the internet, and although we don't see a great deal, at least we see something. Something from a part of the pyramid where photos are non-existent. And now to end this video, I'd like to reiterate my wish for the authorities to fully photograph, film and scan the well shaft and the grotto, and also release the pictures, video in a detailed 3D model, so that every aspect of the Great Pyramid is well documented and available to researchers. Surely, by now, this work should have already been done. So, I can only hope that we see more of the Well Shafton Grotto in the future. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.